these streaming providers are locked in this crazy competition for viewerships and subscriptions, it's actually a great thing for the media localization industry. The conversations tended to be a little bit more around tech, integrating automation and big data to improve machine translation. And welcome everyone to SlaterPod 115. Hello, Andrew. Hello, Florian. Great to be talking with you again on SlaterPod. What's going on? Where are you, man? I am in a hotel room in Palo Alto. Uh, just following up after two days in sunny San Diego at Gala's 20th anniversary. Living the life in California. Living the life. Uh, up here now currently, uh, XTM Live is today and tomorrow. So just wanted to uh, you know, see what different vendors are doing and also try to visit some of the interesting startups you know, in Silicon Valley and, and, and also visit people in San Francisco to get a finger of the pulse. This is where one engine of our, of our audiences and uh, Northern California and also Gala. Gala was a very interesting experience, quite positive to see a lot of people who are you know, at the core of the community, uh, the, the language industry community and gathering and, and uh, exchanging a lot of stories. So it was, a, it, was a good, it was a good conference. Excellent. Yeah, we had you joining. We had Seema flying down from Chicago. And, uh, and now you're, you're heading to XDM Live, which is, is happening today, right? It's happening today. So after this, I'll head, head there. And, uh, but I do want to give a shout out to Seema. Seema was really, really excellent. Um, she, she was walking around talking to you know, a lot of industry players. She, you, know, you know how much she loves the technology side, so she was you know, uh, talking to people about their interpreting businesses and, and the platforms that are coming up and getting a lot of attention. And she was also talking you know, to a lot of the people who were trying to build their data sets and everything for MT. So she was really, uh, it'll be interesting to see what she produces and what her takeaways from this are, and I'm sure she'll be discussing that with you. Absolutely. No pressure, Seema. We announced it on the podcast uh, and now we need to uh, do the follow-up coverage. But look, before we go back into a bit more detail about Gala, let's discuss one of the big stories that uh, broke just after Esther and I recorded her very last uh, podcast, uh, potentially this year, depending on uh, how long the maturity leave will be. Um, uh, a big story broke. Uh, when uh, RWS's shares went up after a, a, a an announcement of a potential takeover. So let's break this down just a little bit. It's very kind of, uh, there's not too much information out there, but a, a, a private equity firm called Bearing, Barring, Bearing, huh? Bearing Private Equity, Bearing, yeah, Bearing Private Equity, Asia Fund, whatever, eight, uh, confirmed that they are, quote unquote, in the preliminary stages of considering a possible offer to take over RWS. I mean, that's quite, uh, quite the hedging there, Prelim preliminary considering possible. Uh, okay, we got it. You, you might back out of this. Uh, but still, so a private equity fund, uh, they confirmed uh, both RWS and Bering confirmed that this was in response to press speculation. We didn't actually find the press speculation. So maybe they wanted to kind of front run a story or something that was about to come out. Uh, and then Bering said there can be no certainty that any offer will be made, etc. But yeah, it's a, it's a big player. It's a, a Hong Kong based private equity firm. They got $21 billion in so-called assets under management. Um, and, you know, this came just about a month after RWS unveiled their new strategy at their Capital Markets Day in like late March. And what happened afterwards is like their shares, RWS's shares went up 20% on the news and they kind of held firm since. Uh, yeah, interesting. I mean, what's your take there? I mean, we've seen the, I mean, RWS shares kind of getting a little bit caught up in the overall market sell-off. So, um, you know, came down somewhat and uh, now obviously jumped, jumped quite a lot. But what's your take on this? Well, I mean, the timing is certainly interesting coming after the capital markets day and, and, and RWS spent, you know, a lot of time and energy speaking to investors and analysts, uh, breaking down their business and their plans going forward. So, you know, there was this moment of uh, enhanced visibility on what's going on in the business. And I think you're right, 100% on that uh, there's a market route going on right now. So a lot of good companies are having their share prices depressed. And it's almost a, you know, a statement of value, I think, in, in that you have this institutional investor uh, looking at uh, an opportunity to get into a good industry uh, with a company that has used M&A quite effectively to transform its business. 
and you know private equity likes to come in and and see where they can help in these types of plays. So in, in many ways, it's probably an affirmation of the opportunity that they see. But again, you know, you, it's very hard in the stock market to start acquiring shares without people starting to gossip. And, you know, who knows where the information was trickling out. Um, and, and then, of course, you know, you have to start making declarations in the stock market. So it is also a little bit surprising that it's happening so early in, in sort of the negotiation cycle. But at the same time, I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's almost an endorsement. And you can see the market kind of getting a wake up call. And, and jumping on board with, with that idea that, that, that there is great value in RWS's business model. Yeah, and then it came out actually this week with uh, probably what was planned a little longer, the their um, uh, update, what are they calling a trading update? Uh, and they said, basically just confirmed uh, prior guidance that you know profit for the half year, half year, six months, came at around 76 million US dollars compared to 64 in the prior year. So profits are up a little bit. Um, organic growth was uh, flat somehow, uh, rather on the top line was roughly 1% um, and up to now $454 million for half a year. So, you know, if they boost a little bit, they might get to that billion dollar revenue mark. Um, yeah, so we'll watch this space and see uh, what's going what's gonna to happen. I'm pretty sure they're going to have to announce something, uh, even if that doesn't progress. So it will be interesting. I was, I was mentioning in the newsletter, I mean, if, if they also go private equity, then TransPerfect will be the only super agency that's not private equity. I mean, you got, you know, uh, Aqualot is private equity. We localize is private equity. Um, who else do we have? Limebridge is private equity. Uh, and then uh, RWS would be too. So uh, we're left with uh, TransPerfect as a privately uh, kind of owner-operated, non-private equity company. I think Phil Shaw is, is very much an independent entrepreneur. I, I really don't see him taking on any money. So I think he'll probably remain uh, you know, a, a, an operator uh, of his own business. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how he continues to square against the, these professional investors. Um, but maybe more to, to what you've been also covering. Uh, I mean, you've also seen a lot of institutional money coming in at the mid-tier, and I think there's been a lot of interest in M&A activity. Do you, do you have any thoughts you can share on that? Well, let's see. Uh, I mean, it just continues now, of course, with the market route and just generally much more uncertain kind of macroeconomic environment. I would expect a bit of a slowdown, but there's still a lot going on. And I mean, there's still transactions being announced like one or two a week, so, you know. We, we, I mean, even our last call, we had the, the last call, last podcast, a couple of podcasts ago, we had so much M&A to go through that we, I mean, you know, we, we were afraid that it was going to get a little boring for the listeners. So uh, let's move on to another topic, uh, which we also spoke about last time, very, very briefly. I just want to kind of um, act, make sure that we um, touch that. So Zoo Digital, the media localization company, came out with upgraded guidance and basically confirmed something that we spoke about in, in the last podcast, that as the streaming providers uh, are locked in this crazy um, you know, competition for viewerships and subscriptions, it's actually a great thing for the media localization industry. So even if Netflix gets hammered at, on the stock market, a uh, company like Zoo upgrades their guidance. They're now, um, uh, they grew 78% compared to the prior year. They did some M&A, but a lot of it is also organic. Uh, EBITDA is, um, is about $8 million. Uh, they increased that uh, by $2 million, um, uh, the forecast that is. And then, yeah, uh, a, a number of those brokerage firms like Singer Capital Markets or uh, Stiefel actually came out with very positive research reports. You know, we get those research reports by these capital markets guys. And uh, one of them said that uh, Zoo is establishing itself as a winner, as a major, me as major media organizations now engage in a land grab uh, to counter churn in the saturated North American market. Well, what does it mean? I mean, you, you you live in Asia, Andrew. So, you know, this is where the growth is in terms of sub subscriber count rather than the no North America where probably everybody has four or five kind of streaming uh, subscriptions already. Yeah, I mean, if you if you look at Netflix and, and also CNN Plus, which they launched and didn't make it in record time, it does show that, uh, you know, the OTT business is is really heating up. So, so you know, the problems or, or the challenges of Netflix or CNN or anybody else aren't necessarily the problems of, of, um, of those media localizers who like, you know, Zoo or Ayuno, 
who are, are getting you know, good business from a, a, an increased number of OTT players. So I, I think um, you know, Zoo, Zoo's been doing very, very well. I mean, this is not their first uplift. I think they've been rolling up a, a number of um, a, a quarters now, uh, maybe, maybe a year and a half of growth. Um, and so you know, they're, they're getting their technology right, um, and, uh, and their clients must be happy. And, and, and so they really look to be on a roll, which is, which is good. And I, I, I think you know, you, you've looked at the media space. You put out the audio visual report. There's also you know, probably growth areas just beyond media, right? Like in e-learning and other areas. So I, I don't know if they have clients in those areas as well. Yeah, like YouTube, for example. I mean, there's lots of stuff going on on YouTube, which we should keep an eye on. So um, was media at all a topic at Gala? Or was it more kind of centered around the conventional localization space? I didn't really get a feel for um, the industry coverage like we do. I think where we probably differentiate a lot more is with the enterprise buyers who, you know, they talk about from the e-commerce sector or we've had media um, or we've had software localization and we really get some, some great case studies uh, and what they're doing there. And, um, uh, but, you know, there, there was, um, first of all, a very positive mood at Gala. It was the 20th anniversary. The 20th anniversary? The 20th anniversary of Gala, yes. Wow. So that is a milestone, you know, for, for the industry. That's a milestone for the association. Um, and, you know, they had a lot of um, uh, attendees, maybe about two-thirds of the attendees have been, you know, our members, and, and, and many of them have been members for more than 10 years. So... You know, it's it's a it's a good community that they have there. But I think you know what was interesting is the co the conversations tended to be a little bit more around tech, um, integrating automation and putting big data to use in, in to improve machine translation, uh, interpreting uh, featured quite a lot. Um, you know, uh, I, I sat in on Kim's presentation for Interprify. Uh, you know, it was good because he really talked about how you know. The technology and the lower price points have opened up new markets, which we benefited when we did, you know, Silicon Tokyo. Um, and then, you know, Kudo were there um, and, and, and the other platforms were there. Um, and then, you know, there was a little bit of discussion about M&A. Uh, there was a little bit of discussion uh, about operational efficiency. There were a few product demos. We don't really do the product demos, but, you know, so there was a mix of, of, of good um, topics. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, for me, the, the, the best part was really the networking, um, you know, seeing a lot of people we haven't seen in two years, um, getting beyond, you know, the kind of stories you get in a Zoom call. And uh, so there, there's, a, there's a lot happening in our industry uh, and there's a lot of growth opportunity. What was the mood like uh, with the people? What was the, you know, how did they feel just coming back? I think this was, yeah, one of the first in-person bigger in-person conferences? The mood was very positive. Uh, first of all, the venue in San Diego at the Hyatt there, very sunny and uh, a, a great place for people to meet. The weather was fantastic. Um, uh, the, I think the audience and the community were very positive to, to be getting together again. You know, there's a strong core to the, the Gala community and, and to the language industry. Um, and I think people were very happy to, to have uh, deeper, longer engaged conversations. Um, the topics that were discussed were, you know, they kind of ran the gambit. Um, you know, there was a little bit more focus on perhaps technology. Interpreting featured quite prominently, uh, RSI in particular. Of course, like in all language conferences, they, they focused a bit on growth. So, you know, maybe some of it organically, some of it um, uh, through M&A. They didn't quite dive as deep as we do in, in say, industry verticals, but I think overall the mood was very positive. And I think, you know, um, SEMA was also there and, and there's probably going to be a few announcements and stories that I think will flow out, out of the conference uh, from some of the players. So there's a lot going on in our industry and there's a chance for people to talk and get together. Probably interpreting would have been something that was a little more in the back burner up until, you know, 2019. But now, I mean, these companies have been funded like, you know, with dozens and dozens of millions. So... Um, you know, the interpretifies the kudos, the interactios. So they, they probably had something uh, to tell. So, uh, and now it's off for you to XTM Live, right? Well, I'm going to be heading off to XTM Live. And, and I also had a chance to, you know, to catch up with a lot of people there at Gala. Uh, I had a chance to talk to Translated. Um, you know, they've been doing a lot of work with some of the large companies in, here in California. 
and, and they were kind enough to invite me to their boat. So uh, I'm going to see if I have any sea legs uh, on Friday to, to go on their, their boat that they're going to race around the world. You're not going to race around the world, are you? Apparently, this is my sales training, the first time on a sales boat. And they're going to put us all in the right gear and they're going to take us out in the bay for a couple of hours. Uh, and so it's going to be very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> is is Marco, is he actually going on that trip? Like, is he actually going on the ship for a month on end or? I, I'm not sure, but um, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he is. Uh, I think, um, and I'll ask for sure, uh, but but they've also opened it up. And so what they're doing is is having any industry players who, who want to apply, who wanted to train. Uh, so, you know, maybe it's their customers, maybe it's other people from the industry. I don't know if you like sailing, Florin, uh, the, they, they, they let people do different legs. It's a, it's a fascinating exercise and um, no technology from uh, anything past 1960s. So no GPS, no satellite phones. It's uh, really uh, uh, a very interesting race. Now I'm a mountain person and I need technology. So uh, <laughs> yeah, you go, you go and, and do the sailing. All right, uh, cool. Thanks so much for joining, Andrew. Well, thanks for having me, Florian. See you in Europe soon. Excellent, see you in the summer, bye.